listen, there are people in the well, some of whom are yawning and some of whom had their eyes closed. So Devin has a big responsibility to wake you all up. I'm not pointing out any names, Alan Doyle, or anything like that. <laughs> Um, I'm Grace Worcester. I am on the program committee of this Olive Group, and um, I wanted to mention what the program is next week. Uh, I think most of you are familiar with Bess O'Brien, who is a filmmaker. Um, she's going to do, what are we calling it, telling stories and making movies. She's going to illustrate her talk with clips from the documentaries that she's made and she's going to talk about how telling stories and raising the voices of those who are often unheard help create dialogue around important issues. How many of you have seen one of Bess's films before? Quite a few, so most of you are aware of her work. So today, um, we have what I hope is going to be a very interesting talk. <laughs> 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 I asked Devin if there was anything he wanted me to say about him special, and he said that he was a nice guy. And I said, I've only met you one time before this, and so I'm really not sure. So after the talk, we can vote. In other words, <laughs> so um, I had the pleasure of taking a tour with Devin of a very interesting architectural house in Barrie. Remind me again of the name of the architect. Don McKnight. Don McKnight. Does some of you know Don McKnight? Anyhow, it was fascinating to be with Devin because he knew so much. And as I said to him, the thing that I liked best about me meeting Devin was that he had his teenage son with him, and he was really interested and even admitted it. <laughs> Not to me. Well, he did, he did to me. Uh, so Devin is the state architectural historian at the Vermont Division for Historic Preservation. Uh, did you all know that we had a state architectural historian? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know everything. You worked in the state house. <laughs> well, I used to work for the Department of Libraries, and people were amazed that we had a state librarian. And uh, people, a friend of mine would say, you know, every state has a state flower and a state bird and, and a state librarian. So I guess it's sort of, I think I need to stop talking. <laughs> So Devin has worked there since 20, 2006. He earned his master's in historic preservation at UVM, and he has a BA in art history. And I will turn this over before I embarrass myself anymore. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. And wow, that's a lot to live up to. So <laughs> I'll do my best. Do we, have get, do we want to hit the lights for uh, the visuals here? Can you hit the lights? Are they oh, yes. over there? Um, so uh, this is a great, uh, a topic of great interest to me uh, because it, it blends two topics that I'm very interested in, art history and architecture. And uh, thus the title, Art and Architecture of the New Deal. See what I did there. Um, and it's research that I've been doing over the years. Just kind of when I'm in a town, checking out what's around and, and flagging these New Deal projects. And uh, really, really trying to understand what the New Deal was about, and more importantly, how it impacted Vermont. So the New Deal, if you've done any, if you know anything about it, it's called you know, alphabet soup of federal programs. You know, the CWA, the ERA, the Treasury Department, the WPA, the PWA, the FAP, it's just, it's ridiculous. <laughs> and even in going back through uh, historical, you know, firsthand sources, uh, even the federal agencies confused the acronyms, which they couldn't sort it out either. So it's, I don't feel too bad if I, I mess up which branch of which agency did something, but I think I've got it nailed down pretty well. So all of these overlapping programs, and they were set up as specific branches of the federal government, uh, they all had different goals, but they worked together. Uh, so that you might have the Treasury Department uh, building a post office 
and then working with the Works Proge Progress Administration to commission artwork for, the, for that post office. So they overlap a lot. But the, main, the, the three main goals of the New Deal, and especially its art and building programs, were to first provide employment for out-of-work uh, laborers, uh, builders, contractors, architects, as well as artists. Uh, second was to provide public artwork for public buildings. And third was to bring art to the general public, to get art out of the, uh, the realm of the museum, which could be intimidating for the average person. And we have to remember that in the 1930s, most people did not own original works of art for display in their house, unless you were wealthy uh, or had access to a larger urban area that had a public museum. Vermont really didn't. Uh, the Fleming Art Museum wasn't founded until 1931. Uh, here in Montpelier, though, you had the Wood Gallery. So that was very unique for Montpelier to have that great uh, resource of the T.W. Wood Gallery. But otherwise, fine art was really limited to what somebody might see on Sunday in a church, maybe a stained glass window or a painting of a saint, virgin and child. Um, and it, it really wasn't part of the everyday life of the average American. And a lot of these, uh, one of the stated goals of these New Deal art programs was to get the art to the public. Instead of expecting people to go to a museum, put the artwork in the town hall, put the artwork in the post office, where people go every day on routine business, the public library, and that way they can't avoid it. <laughs> you know, it's right there. Um, so that was a big emphasis of this program, was uh, art for the general public. We'll be looking mainly at work done for the Treasury Department. And in the 1930s, uh, the Treasury Department was responsible for uh, the design and construction of all federal buildings in the country. So today it's the General Services Administration. Treasury Department, because they held the purse strings, they doled out the money so they controlled the designs. And the Treasury section of painting and sculpture, often just called the section, that was the branch of the Treasury Department that was in charge of the mural decorations for post offices that we'll be looking at today. So, you know, the 1930s was a dramatic time in American history. You've got the Depression, you know, you've got the Jazz Age. Um, this is an example of uh, painting by Stuart Davis, very important early modernist American painter from 1938. This was a WPA Federal Art Project mural. Um, you know, this is vibrant and jazzy and abstract and colorful. Um, it's actually a scene of Gloucester, Massachusetts, um, heavily abstracted. Um, but, you know, this, this is a pivotal point in American art history when you have uh, artists like Stuart Davis and Marsden Hartley um, really exploring early modernism and abstraction on, on one hand. And on the other hand, you have people uh, who really want to look back to, you know, this is the Depression, and they want to look back to the good old days and more representative art and uh, works that display a more uh, traditional kind of nostalgic view of life in America. You know, Works like this, Baptism in Kansas by John Stuart Curry, 1938. Uh, you know, th this is known as regionalism, heavy emphasis on the Midwest, the breadbasket of the country, that stronghold of good virtue and values. And I'm from Minnesota, so I can say that. <laughs> um, but this was really, you know, these, these are the two forces at work in American art. Stuart Davis, modern, bold, bright, and much more traditional, rural scene, the heavens are opening up, the sunshine, the doves, the classic rural farm. So with the New Deal art projects, they absolutely, for murals that are permanently installed in buildings, in federal buildings, they wanted this. They did not want this. Yes? How big are these paintings? 
So Swing Landscape is a mural, uh, I want to say that this is maybe eight by six feet. Um, it was actually painted for a public housing project, um, but then never installed. It was sold privately. It, I don't know why. <laughs> um, but uh, this is not this big. This is not a mural. This is an easel painting. Um, so, but the, the subject matter, looking back in a lot of kind of the good old days of, of early America, is what the section of fine arts and the federal arts projects really latched onto is that's what they wanted these artists to portray. They didn't want really wacky modernism. <laughs> Other examples are Good Earth, also by John Stuart Curry. Uh, you know, the, the notion of the heroic farmer, you know, the individual in the field with his children and the bountiful harvest. And remember, this is the Dust Bowl, Great Depression. So this is an idealized view. The little farmstead off in the uh, the background, but the you know that that notion of the the rugged individual, if you will, you know, really strong, able-bodied, the next generation. Uh, this is what the section wanted to promote in the paintings that were produced. And Thomas Hart Benton, uh, probably the most famous, uh, or well, maybe. But there's this trifecta, triumvirate of painters, John Stuart Curry, Thomas Hart Benton, and Grant Wood. Um, Benton really takes almost a surrealist approach to the landscape, but still, it's, it's this harvest. It's the, the natural wilderness, this bounty, um, trying to show this idealized rural agrarian culture. And Grant Wood, uh, this is a little print, and I love this is the most geometrically perfect <laughs> planting of corn you will ever see. <laughs> um, you know, it's just, so you can see stylistically, you know, this, you can almost see Grant Wood laying this out with a compass and protractor, you know, versus Thomas Hart Benton with his swooping, you know, kind of rolling waves of landscape. But they're all getting at that heart of the rural, uh, rural America, the, the, the good America. And if this looks familiar to someone, that little cottage in the back, it's a play on Grant Wood's famous American Gothic with the little Gothic Revival cottage in the back. So these painters were, were enormously popular in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, Norman Rockwell, um, that, that era. So some of the influences on the murals that we'll see um, certainly come from not only the, the fine art world with Benton and, and Curry and Wood, but also from popular illustration, N.C. Wyeth um, and his lineage, Andrew Wyeth, uh, with these illustrating these classic novels, Treasure Island, and you know, these great illustrations and books that people were looking at. And other works, uh, Howard Pyle, who was actually N.C. Wyeth's teacher. This is 1897, so quite a bit earlier, but he's showing these kinds of uh, dramatic, you know, Battle of Bunker Hill, you know, pivotal moments in American history, kind of rah rah, go, you know, very patriotic um, and large, uh, exciting scenes with action and, you know, cannon and guns and smoke. So this was also influencing what, uh, what type of work the section, the Treasury Department, was saying would be appropriate for these public murals. And of course, we can't talk about public murals without talking about Diego Rivera, the famous Mexican muralist who, at this very 1933, he's commissioned to do a huge mural right in the lobby of Rockefeller Center. This is a plum assignment. And he started work on it, uh, started, and this was a fresco, so he's actually laying the colored plaster onto the wall permanently. And uh, he submitted one proposal that was approved and created something completely different, <laughs> um, which didn't go over well with the Rockefellers, um, partly because it included a portrait of Vladimir uh, Lenin and a not so flattering portrait of John D. Rockefeller Jr. where he's drinking and cavorting with women of ill repute. It, they were paying him to do this. <laughs> so, so the Rockefellers actually said, you're, you're done. They destroyed the fresco. 
ripped it off the wall, it's gone. Um, there's, what you see in the upper right is a recreation that Rivera did in Mexico City. Um, but this was a huge fiasco, public relations nightmare <laughs> for everyone involved. And the federal government did not want anything like this to happen. So with, with the section murals, absolutely, you know, they put the kibosh on any sort of political statement. They did not want this to become anything controversial in a community. It still did in some cases, but overall, you know, the artists are smart. And they knew that if they were going to submit a proposal for a, a mural, they learned pretty quickly what the government wanted. So that's what they would give them. And it became known in the artistic community as painting the section. You know, so an, an artist might say, well, it's not really what I would want to do, but I'm painting it for the section. So you know, they, they want a big heroic farmer, they want a wheat field, they want a sun in the sky. You know, I'll, I can do that. So the government started getting what they wanted and avoided, and hoped to avoid situations like this. So into the buildings, um, there are five post offices in Vermont that have uh, these murals. They're often referred to as WPA murals. They're not. And this is where that alphabet soup comes in. These are uh, treasury relief art project murals through uh, the section of fine arts. So you know, at the end of the day, if you just call it a New Deal mural, you're safe. <laughs> so, but Rutland was the first uh, series of murals done and uh, created to decorate the lobby of the uh, courthouse, post office and courthouse in Rutland. And that was built in 1931. So these murals came a couple years after construction of the building. And the artist uh, was Stephen Belaski. And he was a local boy. He grew up, born and raised in Bellows Falls, Vermont. So as we'll see later, a lot of these murals, the painters were coming from out of state because they were national competitions. But this one uh, went to Stephen Belaski, and he chose as the subject matter these key moments in Vermont history. And if we look at uh, some of the first ones, it's a beautiful lobby. It's actually being restored right now. Um, so at some point, if you're in Rutland, just pull over and go inside. They're beautiful paintings. Um, this triptych uh, shows early history of Vermont with Ethan Allen, of course. I uh, can't paint Vermont history without a picture of Ethan Allen here. And in the middle, the Green Mountain Boys. And on the right um, is a painting called the Beach Seal. And this is a Yorker. So he's raising his fist against Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys uh, for claiming what New York thought was their land and the New Hampshire grants overlapped. And the beach seal, uh, you can just make out, these figures here are holding uh, tree branches, switches from a tree, from a beech tree. And this was a form of colonial corporal punishment where uh, somebody you don't uh, agree with, round him up and give him a few whacks with, <laughs> and, that, and the welts that it would leave, that was the beach seal, <laughs> literally. <laughs> and you can tell he's already been through something, because look, his pants, his stocking is torn, pulled down, his pants are torn. So whether the beach seal has already been applied or is about to be applied, um, not quite sure. But uh, so there's a lot of thought that went into these paintings and research and documentation. Uh, another picture uh, mural in the same lobby, uh, the Green Mountain Boys, and this shows them gathered at the window of the Breckenridge Farm, uh, fighting off the sheriff from Albany who was coming to, to kick them off the land with the New, with the New York uh, grants, and they're, they're standing strong and chase them away. And this is an, a very interesting one, uh, freeing the first slave in the state of Vermont. And this is a depiction of uh, November 28th, 1777, Captain Ebenezer Allen uh, from Bennington 
reading a certificate of emancipation for Dinah Mattis and her uh, small child who are shown in the center of the picture here. And uh, they were rescued from a British uh, baggage uh, train, uh, basically troops moving through the area, and emancipated. And what's really neat is uh, I think Stephen Belaski was a pretty cool guy. <laughs> just I've researched him, and he's just got character. And you can tell this, this figure here, sitting with his back to us, has a canteen down here. And if you look at it closely, on the canteen, SJB, Stephen J. Belaski. <laughs> so he painted himself in. Um, so it's these, those little details that if you, I looked at this painting many times before I saw that little initials on the canteen. So you can go back and always find something new. And they're great history lessons. And another one in the same space, Benedict Arnold commanding the naval battle on Lake Champlain. And this is really that kind of heroic um, American Revolution scene. And you can tell that this is heavily influenced by work by people like N.C. Wyeth and Captain John Paul Jones. You know, very similar uh, composition and use of the, the strong central heroic figure um, leading the charge with his sword. So this was picking up on a lot, of, a lot of trends that were going on in the art and illustration worlds at the time. So Rutland is, is the most extensive collection um, with its, I think, seven individual mural panels. Um, the other post offices tend to have one main large rectangular mural, as you'll see. Um, so White River Junction, uh, Douglas Crockwell did this mural in 37. And all of these murals are painted oil on canvas. And they were done in the artist's studio and then taken to the building and glued to the wall. So they're not frescoes, and they're not painted directly to the wall surface. Um, they were done off-site. The uh, post office and the, the treasury uh, would give the artist the exact dimensions of the space they were to fill. And then the artist would have canvas cut to that size, paint the painting in their studio, and then bring it to be installed. So Crockwell, also a very interesting individual. Um, born in Ohio, uh, lived most of his life in Glens Falls, and did a few other murals, one in Endicott, New York, one in Mississippi. So you can see how, with the growth of this program, artists started branching out to other states that maybe weren't their home state. Uh, Crockwell was also an inventor, an experimental filmmaker, uh, really a, a fascinating person. Um, and all these artists were, uh, these are highly trained, highly skilled artists. These are not just Sunday painters who thought, oh, wouldn't it be nice to decorate the post office? These are serious, trained artists. So Crockwell, and here's a, a picture of him painting uh, the mural. And we have a, his descendants have a great collection of the letters uh, from the Treasury Department to him. And this one is nice because it lays out, uh, he was paid $1,280 to create the mural in three installments. Now first for your sketch, second for when you're half done with the mural, and then finally the final portion when it's completed, installed, and approved. So there was a lot of checks and balances. The artists were not just given free reign. They had to submit sketches. Sketches had to be approved. Then they had to uh, you know, lay out their mural, get approval again. They would send people, the treasury would send people out to check up on progress, make sure nobody was sneaking in Vladimir Lenin uh, into their pictures. Um, so they were really, um, really a lot of oversight. And you know, this last paragraph talks about a different project where they say, you know, the second subject matter would not, I'm afraid, fit within the, scene, the scheme of subject matter. So right here you can see they're saying, yeah, no, we don't like your idea. <laughs> Do something else. So a lot of control over what was created in these murals. This is the mural, and it's at the end wall of what was the, uh, the lobby of the post office. 
This building is now largely used by the Center for Cartoon Studies. It's, they have their library in it. And I think you can generally step into this lobby and see the mural um, without going through much, too much effort. And Crockwell, very interesting composition. All the other painters basically filled the canvas from edge to edge, top to bottom, with, with some sort of scenery. Crockwell developed this kind of dumbbell-shaped composition in which this background of sky wraps just around the edges and becomes the river flowing through the middle of the composition, partly because he had to deal with this darn <laughs> pediment on top of the door, which is tough to integrate into a re rectangular uh, form. But you know, a lot of creativity. And the subject matter that he was working with, um, so on the left, he's showing uh, traditional Vermont industries, certainly the stone industries, uh, quarrying, marble here. And you can tell he did his research also. This man is splitting off chunks of stone with the plug and feather technique, uh, with a little diagram here where uh, two iron feathers wedge are placed in a hole that's drilled in the stone. And then this wedge is driven between, and the force splits the stone apart. Very labor intensive. Um, but he knew he had to depict it properly, because <laughs> people in, uh, in Vermont know uh, how this is done. And on the right-hand side, we have a more agricultural scene uh, where they're harvesting maple syrup, harvesting sap from the trees. And this also shows the farmer with a tractor, so a little modern technology coming in, plowing the fields. Um, and also the tree stumps, you know, they're, they're clearing the forest. It's partly for growth of the farm, partly for firewood. Um, but this is showing you know, there's an impact of these people on the landscape. So it's not just a, a pretty postcard view of Vermont landscape. It's showing how people really use the landscape. And in the background, the little farmhouse and the barn. And boy, this, this hill, is, it's straight out of Rutland County. It's, I don't know for sure if that's where he was painting, but it's um, right in the mountain range there around Hubberton, spot on. Hmm? So Which building yeah. was that, one in? that is in the White River Junction okay. post office. Yep. Looks a lot like Benton's work. It does. Yep. Very similar to Benton with these kind of flowing, uh, you know, very painterly uh, loose uh, brushwork. So in St. Albans, you'll see a trend here. These first three, you know, Rutland, White River, St. Albans, they're all railroad towns. You know, that's where the big industry and commerce was at, in the 1930s. Um, this one uh, was done for the post office and custom house, uh, which is built right in Rutland City, right downtown. And it actually has two murals um, at either end of the large lobby. Uh, Philip Wenceslas von Salza, my favorite name, um, adds another layer of interest uh, because he was an immigrant. His family moved to the US from Sweden when he was six years old, trained as an engineer, fought in the US military in World War I, and was actually held as a POW in Germany, came back to the US and became an artist. And then I imagine it must have been pretty rewarding for him to have been an immigrant, fought in the war, been a POW, to then be hired by his adoptive country to create works of art. You know, that's pretty cool. And his murals, uh, the first one we'll look at is called Haying. And it's another kind of idealized scene of, of cutting the hay on a Vermont farm. And you know, it, it shows the manner in which it was done was really not that different from the 19th century. You know, horses, hay wagons, pitchforks, um, not a lot of technology being shown here. Um, and also, interestingly, there's a couple dancing as 
people do when gathering hay. Um, <laughs> this raised a few eyebrows <laughs> in, in St. Albans. And there are some great newspaper accounts of you know, people saying, well, it's a nice painting, but why are they dancing? <laughs> so yeah, a little artistic license. You've got a, you know, a boy playing the fiddle. Why isn't he helping pitch hay? <laughs> um, so, but again, this really highlights that kind of idealized rural farm life where you know, life is free and good, and the, the barefoot woman in the white dress dancing with the young man. And so it, you know, it's not exactly true to life. And the corresponding mural at the opposite end of the lobby is a winter scene. So uh, this is sugaring off. You'll see a trend here, a lot of maple sugaring. That was <laughs> Vermont <laughs> in a nutshell. Um, and you know, this, this is another kind of quaint scene that was criticized by the St. Albans folk because they said, we don't gather sap this way anymore. That's how our parents used to do it. You know, we don't use oxen. This is the 30s. <laughs> and they complained about these old-fashioned cars. And so really interesting that the intent wasn't necessarily to show present day life. There, it was more a nostalgic view. And the people in these communities sometimes kind of felt like, oh, doesn't really reflect us, but um, that's, um, you know, it's, it's a nice composition. It shows the process of gathering the sap from the woods, carrying it on a yoke with two buckets, and then dumping it into the collector bucket and boiling it. Um, and then again, these kind of playful scenes of kids having a snowball fight, a uh, young boy and a girl, you know, he's wearing a baseball cap. Is he back from college? They're clearly not dressed to work in the woods. You know, what's this little uh, encounter about? So it kind of just a nice, playful scene. Northfield. This was a surprise, uh, because previously we've looked at these you know, urban centers for Vermont, you know, White River, Rutland, St. Albans. But then Northfield and Woodstock, two smaller communities, also have post office murals. And this one was done by Charles Doherty. Uh, whose father was actually a very famous muralist. And uh, Charles worked as an artist, but didn't really pursue it full time. Um, but he did get the commission for the Northfield Post Office. And very hard to find a picture of him. This is, here he is posing as a model for one of his dad's murals. Um, but he uh, did a, a few pieces uh, during the, the New Deal era. And this is the mural in the post office, and it's wonderful. I love this one. Um, and you can see how he really used the full edge to edge, top to bottom, incorporating this door frame in the composition. And it was great. I was, when I took this picture, I was in the lobby, and this is still an active post office. The post office boxes are there, and the customer desk, and I was taking pictures, and a person walked in, and she said, oh, what are you doing? I said, I'm doing some research on these murals, and she looked up and she said, oh, I never saw that before. <laughs> I'm like, good Lord, you know, so pick your head up, <laughs> you know, look up, because <laughs> it's only been there for 80 years now. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, but this got me thinking, you know, why a Northfield post office with a mural of downhill skiers? This should be in Stowe. Turns out in the 30s, Northfield was banking on becoming a ski destination town. They had private trains coming up from New Haven, Connecticut every weekend to ski on one ski hill. I think it was on Payne Mountain in Northfield. They had a little uh, rope tow going up that they built in the 1930s. And Northfield was really hoping to become a ski destination, a winter sports destination. So. This mural tries to depict that, and it, you know, it shows all the current, for the time, ski technology with these uh, you know, hard leather boots and uh, the old bear trap bindings that have a spring that go around your heel and you know, no quick release bindings, uh, heavy wooden skis. And you know, this is when skiing was really an athletic pursuit. You had to know what you were doing, otherwise you could really hurt yourself. Um, there's none of the modern 
you know, shaped skis and really lightweight, quick release equipment that we have today. So, um, so these skiers, you know, in various degrees of uh, skill, this guy's racing down the hill. You can see the cloud of snow that he's kicked up, um, and this guy's kind of hoping to stay upright. This person has fallen down here, so just a fun, lighthearted scene, but gives a little glimpse into that, that history of, of uh, Northfield. Uh, that today most people don't think of Northfield, Vermont. You know, you think of Norwich University, um, but you don't think of downhill ski mecca. And what was the year? Uh, this was, I didn't put that on there. I think 30, is it on the previous slide? 39. 39. Yeah. And then also in another part of the lobby, there are these three medallions, for lack of a better word. They're maybe three feet across in each dimension. And these are nice little vignettes of, again, classic Vermont subject matter. Gathering the maple sap, the heroic farmer, you know, jolly green giant-esque <laughs> farmer here. The only depiction of a cow in any Vermont murals of this era, note. <laughs> um, and then the last one is a stone carver. Northfield was also well known for its uh, stone carving industry. Yeah, are those on canvas? Or yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, those are also on canvas. And they're mounted with uh, this, I think it's just a simple half round wood trim stock that goes around the edges. No goggles either. Nope, no respirators, no goggles, <laughs> just carving away in a shed. <laughs> So in Woodstock, um, you know, if you, the previous murals have been pretty specific. You know, there's a picture of skiing, or there's a picture, you know, of an individual. In Woodstock, the artist, uh, who's the only woman of the group, uh, Bernadine Custer, she depicts 140 years of Woodstock history in one mural. <laughs> so she was very ambitious. And she uh, was also highly trained and lived both in New York City and in Londonderry. And in fact, the Londonderry Historical Society is in her former home, and they've got a huge collection of her work. And all of her papers are at the University of Vermont Special Collections. So that's a gold mine of information. So there she is, uh, a photo from UVM. And as part of that collection, we have the preparatory sketch. So this is what she would have prepared, and this is small. It's maybe you know, four inches by 10 inches, uh, just a little sketch. And this is what she would have submitted to the Treasury Department to say, this is what I'm thinking for this mural. This is the general composition. These are where the figures will be, how the space will be used. The final piece differs a little bit, but it's pretty spot on. So that's uh, how it appears today. And basically, you can read it uh, like a book, starting at the left-hand side. In the background, there's a little log cabin. These are the pioneers, the frontier days. They're you know, people on horseback with their oxen and their wagon full of household goods, taming the wilderness. And then you've got the uh, revolutionary era here uh, with the fight for independence and clearing the lands, chopping down a tree. And then these three figures in the middle um, are really the primary focal point. And corresponding to buildings in the background that relate to their individual endeavors but do not exist in Woodstock. So I thought for sure, oh, these, you know, that's the church. And then, no, it's not. <laughs> totally made up. But the individuals are, here's a close up of uh, the left hand side where you can see the, the pioneers and the revolutionaries coming in. And then in the middle here, I need to look at my notes here to get the names right. So the first one is Hosea Ballou, and he was a Universalist preacher uh, from New Hampshire, but that's okay. Um, he lived in the Woodstock area just for a couple years, but while he was there, he wrote um, a treatise on atonement, which is apparently a pivotal work in uh, Universalism and he was very well regarded and clearly uh, deemed worthy of being in the mural of Woodstock. The second person is Jacob Colomer, 
uh, lawyer, politician, postmaster general under President Taylor. He was from New York, um, but he did live in Woodstock for about 30 years. So he made it into the mural. Is he governor also? Yep. And then the third one, and this will, for any librarians in the audience, um, appreciate John Cotton Dana, library and museum director. He was born in Woodstock, so he definitely deserves to be there. And actually, the Dana family home is now the Woodstock History Center. A phenomenal building. And then, what about this guy on the end? He's the common man. He's not a specific person. He's there to represent just the common resident individual of Woodstock, the hard worker, uh, the, the everyday farmer. Now on the right hand side, it gets interesting. Somehow we have a, an environment in which you can golf and ski at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> so, we have a gas pump, we have a modern automobile, people riding horseback, people hunting. So this is, you know, 1930s present day Woodstock when it's a vacation destination, tourism. You know, this is, you know, selling Vermont uh, for outdoor recreations in the summer, in the winter, and, you know, modern technology with gas pumps, um, and the, the gas pumps were not well received. Um, in this fabulous letter. This is one of my favorites. This is from the postmaster of Woodstock to uh, the assistant chief of the section of fine arts where she says, Woodstock, Vermont is not mural minded. <laughs> they really didn't want this mural, but they were kind of forced into it. But, you know, I guess she's saying, okay, I suppose we appreciate it. <laughs> and then in the last paragraph, <laughs> Woodstock does not put its gas pumps up front. <laughs> she wanted the artist to come back and paint out the gas pump, because that was not appropriate for Woodstock. <laughs> so the artist declined, and the, wood, the gas pumps are there today. <laughs> so, but I think it's really interesting in that here also we see this town saying, Ugh, you know, we, we like the old-fashioned stuff, but uh, none of that dirty gas pumps, ew. Yeah, so it's really interesting on how communities responded. You know, in St. Albans, they complained that the maple sugaring was old-fashioned. Right. You know, whereas here, they're saying, oh, it's too new. So you can't win. <laughs> but this is, this is a great, um, it, really a great, there are articles in local papers about Woodstock doesn't need a post office. Why is this being forced on us? And you know, they got it. <laughs> so, excuse me. Yes. Can you just yes. Go back once. The um, end of the fourth paragraph. I love it. Yes, where she's saying a few, a few strokes might do wonders. Just paint it out. You know, just get rid of that gas pump and you know, clean it up. You'll be all set. <laughs> so, that didn't happen. <laughs> So I said there are five murals, and there are, but there were supposed to be six. There's the unfinished mural, um, unstarted mural, actually. Island Pond was supposed to have a mural, another railroad town, way up in northern Vermont, in Brighton. Um, and Barce Miller was awarded uh, the commission. And this was part of a national competition by Life magazine called the 48 States Competition, where uh, they ran a juried contest to select uh, an artist to do one mural in one post office in every state. And the article is fascinating because, uh, you know, it's pretty blunt. <laughs> where They say, Amer apparently rural Americans are artistic stay-at-homes with a preference for paintings that reproduce experiences and scenes and parts of history with which they are familiar. They're saying, you know, they don't want modern art. Right. They don't want new stuff. They want tried and true, and significantly, the much publicized Main Street atmosphere of small towns does not seem to mean so much to the people who actually live in them. <laughs> so that's pretty bold. <laughs> so, but this competition uh, selected, this is the sketch that Barce Miller did uh, for what he called Lumberyard, 
And in the description uh, of, of the piece, it talks about how Barce Miller has discarded previously favored allegorical figures for more outright reflection of American life. That's what these paintings were about. They didn't want you know, mystical allegorical scenes. They wanted everyday, real life. And so here's uh, you know, a picture uh, of a, a sawmill, uh, two workers cutting up a log, and this is right in Island Pond, and we can, well, you can partly tell because of the island in the pond in the background, but also the train station. This is the Grand Trunk uh, Railroad Station, and clearly Miller is showing this building See the, the peaked gable there, the little tower right here. So definitely he was on the site sketching this, creating this, uh, this proposal. And then there's also the roundhouse and the turntable for the locomotive. Um, so this is very site specific. Interestingly, somehow things got confused. <laughs> and Paul Sample, another very well-known Vermont artist from Norwich, Vermont, artist in residence at Dartmouth, he got a commission for the Westerly Rhode Island Post Office for this scene. And the people in Westerly looked at it and said, that's not our town. <laughs> this is Island Pond. <laughs> Here's our Grand Trunk Railway Station. <laughs> so somehow, whether Sample just submitted, said, ah, this'll do for, for Rhode Island, or the entries got mixed up somewhere, two scenes of Island Pond ended up winning this 48 states competition. Neither one was ever painted, <laughs> unfortunately. It just, the whole, they both went belly up. And there's actually another entry uh, by Pepino Mangravit. Uh, this was his proposal for Island Pond, completely different. Uh, so showing the range of possibilities that artists were compositionally exploring, and uh, it's maple sugaring again. Um, but you, know, you can see the difference from these sort of phased step one, step two, step three approach to Bars Miller and Paul Samples, just straight on single scene kind of snapshot views. I think, you know, maybe spatially, you know, compositionally using the whole wall surface um, and, you know, and its requirements are never slighted. I, I don't know exactly what that means. <laughs> but. What, what is the woman in the other picture doing? The, 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 the triptych one? Looks like hamburger. Looks like hamburger? Oh, she's making um, maple candy. It's a little mold. Yes. Yes. <laughs> or, or flipping hamburgers, whichever you prefer. <laughs> so luckily, the murals today, they're all intact. They're all in pretty good condition, mostly because they're up high. They're, they're a good 8 to 10 feet off the floor, so nobody can touch them. Nobody can, you know, bang a mail cart into them or, you know, scrape them in any way. So generally, they're in pretty good shape. And, but, you know, as I said, with the Northfield, they're largely overlooked. A lot of people don't even take the time to look up and just think about what they're seeing. So, um, so hopefully, you know, if we can raise awareness at the very least that they're there. And, and it seems like the, post, the postmasters appreciate them. They're, they were all very wel welcoming and said, yeah, take all the pictures you want when I would show up. So, so they appreciate them. A couple other examples around the state that are not post office murals, but are also New Deal murals. Um, this was a federal arts project by Stephen Belaski. He did the uh, Rutland post office. And these are enormous. That central panel is probably at least 15 feet wide. Um, and they're in the stairwell of the main entry to the building. And on the other wall is this corresponding piece, also Federal Arts Project. Uh, other examples of art from the New Deal, this is the 
Emma Willard Monument, uh, which is in Middlebury. It's on a little little island, <laughs> kind of in that crazy intersection where you either continue on 7 or go downtown. Um, but really a beautifully carved, low-relief marble piece uh, by Marion Guild and Pierre Zwick, who designed it. This was a federal arts project. And these things turn up. This was last fall. Um, I got an email from UVM saying, we broke into a wall and found a painting. <laughs> so I scurried over there and they were doing demolition, started ripping off sheetrock and found a painting behind the wall. <laughs> so this was a public works of art project um, depicting the Champlain Thrust Fault at Lone Rock Point on, uh, in Burlington Bay. A very famous geological feature. And this had actually been painted for the Fleming Museum when it had a collection of geology um, specimens and was then removed to this building and glued to the wall and decades ago, uh, they wanted to remodel. They couldn't get the painting off the wall, so they just built a wall in front of it, which is actually a really good solution. <laughs> it just, they just said, we don't want to wreck it. We're just going to leave it and build in front of it. What is, what where is, where is this painting? Where is the subject matter? Uh, or, I mean, or the, where is the actual building? painting? Which building? So the painting now, oh, which building? It, ha it used to house the geology department before that moved to Delahanty. I can't remember the name of the building now. But the painting has since been removed. So they hired a conservator who came out very carefully, carefully detached the glue from the wall surface, rolled it up, stabilized everything, and it'll be conserved and then reinstalled in Delahanty Hall where the geology department is today. And it's great because every fall, Intro to geology, the classes have to trek out to this spot and draw this. And so now they can look at it every day when they go to class. <laughs> so, but you know, these things turn up. You, you never know where they, might, uh, where they might be. In terms of buildings programs, uh, there were a couple primary sources of construction, the CCC, Civilian Conservation Corps, the PWA, Public Works Administration, and the Resettlement Administration. And in Vermont, we have some amazing examples of uh, CCC work uh, that's modernist. This is very unusual. Most CCC work around the country was indigenous to the local area. So if you're in New Mexico, the CCC was building with adobe. You know, if you're in New England, they were using log. But this architect, David Freed, somehow managed to get approved this project. This is the ski lodge at Mount Mansfield. It's still there today. Um, it's log and rustic, but this is cutting edge modernist design. This wall of windows, uh, and you can see this historic view. And the CCC, not only were they building buildings, they were building ski trails. This is, uh, I think, nosedive. Or, or one of the one of the lift lines coming up. Um, they basically built the ski industry in Vermont uh, in the 1930s. Uh, Vermont forester Perry Merrill saw that. Oh, here's thousands of young men. Start cutting trail. <laughs> so Stowe would not exist today were it not for the CCC. I mean, the ski industry, you know, is owes its life to the CCC really. Another very interesting project at Crystal Lake State Park in Barton, also by David Freed. And again, very modern form. But I think the way Freed was able to get these approved was partly, I think, because it was Vermont. And the signature blocks from Washington, DC on the plans are not signed. I think DC said, <laughs> It's Vermont, just do it. <laughs> it's far away, nobody will know. <laughs> so these, you know, very modern design, but common material. This is brick and stone, board and batten siding, wood siding on the lower levels. Very easy to build, but in a new form. 
So this isn't certainly not a quaint old rustic log cabin, uh, but it's using materials and construction techniques that were very familiar to the, the young men building these. Another, and this is more typical of CCC, the Hubbard cabin at the Middlebury Snow Bowl. This cabin is still there. Um, it's in rough shape, but it's still there. And then buildings, uh, you know, this is the Cabot Village School. This was a public works administration project where they really wanted to have projects that had a direct public impact. And certainly in Vermont, this is when there were still a lot of one-room schoolhouses. So here's a consolidated school uh, designed by Freeman French Freeman Architects of Burlington. And this was actually featured in a national publication about the PWA as a really good example of a, a good project. And you know, imagine if you lived in Cabot and suddenly here's the government coming in and saying, we're going to build you this beautiful new school. That would mean a lot. And <laughs> I just found this picture this morning. <laughs> so at Cabot, being thrifty Vermonters, Every New Deal project had a sign that said what the agency was, what the project was. So here's Cabot School, project number, da 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 da. They recycled the sign as the backboard for their basketball hoop. <laughs> That's how thrifty we are. <laughs> yeah, it was a fed, the sign was some federal property, so they, <laughs> they put it to good use. And this was picked up in correspondence at the federal level, like, look what they did in Cabot. <laughs> so really wonderful. Um, but other projects, Southwick Hall at UVM. This was a PWA project. McKim, Mead, and White were the architects. So this wasn't simply little rural, you know, simple projects. You know, this was a major building that really had an impact. This is at the time when uh, the Redstone campus was the women's campus at UVM. And here's a major investment in a facility for women attending the university. So that has a huge impact. Tracy Hall in Norwich, uh, their town hall. You know, this was a PWA project. And another one of my favorites, the sewage disposal plant in St. Albans. Uh, have you ever seen a more beautiful sewage disposal plant? <laughs> Look at the striped canvas awnings, rock-lined gravel paths. I think this, you know, some sort of settling tank appeared with St. Albans sewage plant spelled out in white rocks, landscaped grounds. I mean, this is really cream of the crop here. <laughs> um, That's what it was built as, Yeah, yep. So the, the, the PWA did everything from you know, curbs and gutters to full sewage treatment plants. You know, it ran, runs the gamut. <laughs> so bridges, yep. Yeah. Yeah, and, and again, if you lived in St. Albans, this was a big deal. Suddenly you've got a municipal sewage plant? That's huge. It's really, it's a pivotal change in Vermont life. Did the Public Works Administration was funded by the federal government? Yes. And it had an office in Washington? Yep, Wisconsin. yep. So these are all federally funded under Roosevelt's New Deal and really just trying to get that cash infusion and not simply dumping money into projects but also employing people, you know, putting them to work. And here in Montpelier, recognize that? Recreation fields. Is, was that really the largest earthwork pool in the world when it was built? Not only. <laughs> I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Newspaper accounts say that it was the largest asphalt pool in the country. <laughs> that held 1 million and 27 gallons. <laughs> so Montpelier was 
When I was a child, they said there was a larger one in Switzerland. I don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, here's the recreation fields uh, with the pool, the bathhouse, the baseball stadium over here, the football field, soccer field in the middle. Uh, this was all a PWA project, and there's a historic site marker. But, you know, darn it, even that, it says WPA. It was PWA, you know, it's tough. <laughs> <laughs> so, but another thing I love about this picture is look at the landscape. Yeah. 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 Totally clear cut. <laughs> so, a lot of change. Uh, Union Elementary School. This was also a PWA project. Uh, this by uh, architect Robert Graham from New York. Um, again, this was a big deal for. Montpelier to get this beautiful public school building and uh, really see this investment in their community from the federal government. The tower at Hubbard Park, Civilian Conservation Corps, 1936. They worked on this, I think, for about four years. Um, <laughs> no. It was built to look like a ruin, right? Right, yep. Yeah, the sort of rustic stonework. My dad worked on this. Oh, really? Uh -huh. Yeah, so, so these things that we tend to take for granted today, they're easy to just assume, well, it's always been there. Right. Well, they, they haven't. You know, the CCC was amazing. Go to pretty much any state park that existed, you know, pre-1950, there was a CCC state park. The pathways, the roads, the shelters, the picnic areas, the fire pits. All CCC. Okay. In Waterbury, mm -hmm. there used to be a whole town. Yes. And there's still some. Yeah, there was a whole CCC camp in Waterbury, and I think some of the chimney stacks are still standing. Right. Mm -hmm. What's that? Up in the way to. Uh, up in the way to. I can't remember. Is it it's Little River? It's 14. There's a yeah. camp there, and it's still yeah. there, so it's mm -hmm. a sign conservation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so. And there's a big, big field, 500,000, I don't remember. Then it's all lined in oak. Hmm. And you know oak don't grow that big. Yes, <laughs> yep. And yeah. I've often wondered if that oak came at the same time they were building the town. It could be another big project of these New Deal programs and the CCC was reforestation. And you can always spot a CCC forest because the trees are perfect. <laughs> Spaced every six feet on a grid, absolutely perfectly aligned. They just took their saplings and charted out a grid and planted them all. Um, so, you know, not, not like just... Field. Yes, like the cornfield. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, across from the rec center in Montpelier has pine trees. Okay, so, so that that you showed as being all open, yep, is now all grown over with white pine planted. Yep, so that could certainly be one of those reforestation projects. Oh, and they also did the thing, the big dams. Yes, the yep, the Waterbury Dam. Dam. The yep, yeah. yep, flood control dams. Yeah. Planted the, the trees along the North Branch, mm -hmm. which were black willows and the sixty-year trees, and sure enough, they've all died. Ah, uh, they. <laughs> Uh -huh. So yeah, a lot of these plantings are aging out. Yep. And, and that town in Waterbury that was a CCC, there's the remainder of some chimneys that was a building for the officers. Right. Which burned down. Yeah. And they all got killed. Again. Yeah, yeah, tragic that, that, fire there. The windows had been all decorated with iron bars. Mm. So those poor guys who were living there could not escape. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, that was a very unfortunate accident. Um, and with the CCC, there, there were the camps that they actually lived in. So they built their own living quarters, and then there are the projects they built. Um, very few of those camps remain. Um, I know at Camp Downer in, I forget what town that's in. Is there South Royalton, Sharon? Some, some of their buildings are actually converted CCC camp buildings. They survived. Um, so, like I said, there's things out there once you start looking. And that camp down there, I believe, is now a camp for blind children from New York City. 
Hmm. Yeah, so it's still active. Yeah. Yeah, so I can't not mention the wood gallery. It's right next door to us. <laughs> and they are the repository for works of art created under the WPA Federal Art Project. Basically, when all these New Deal programs ended in 1942 because of World War II, there were traveling exhibits all over the country of work created by artists from all over the country. And basically, the, the WPA said, stop. Whatever exhibit you have right now, keep it. And they designated a repository in each state. And the Wood Gallery, really being one of the only art galleries in the state at the time, was officially designated as a repository for uh, the Federal Art Project works. So in that collection, it's totally random. Paintings of the Brooklyn Bridge, New Mexico Desert. You know, it's not like Vermont scenes. Um, it's from all over the country. And it's really worth checking out if you haven't seen it. Um, they've got a great collection there. And uh, several of the artists who did murals also have smaller easel pieces and drawings in the Wood Gallery collection. Um, so you can start to better understand these artists and how they were working and um, you know, what, what they were dealing with in the 1930s. So you're saying that the, the, the artists from all over the country, because there's a traveling show that just happened in Vermont? Right. Yeah, yeah they, they, would, they would transport these exhibits around the country because remember, one of the goals was to get art to the people. And so they would, uh, tens of thousands of works of art were created under these, the Federal Art Project alone. So they would pick some of the best examples, put together an exhibit, send it off to Ohio, to Indiana, to Vermont, to Maine, and traveling all over the country. And then when these programs ended, they just said, Keep it, <laughs> yeah. And that, that work is actually still property of the federal government. The federal government still owns these works of art because uh, they were paid for with public money. So it's probably good that it was the federal government who decided to keep it because many of those projects would not exist without their art. Mm -hmm. Yes. A uh, fun fact on the bridge shown going over the railroad track on the sketch for the in Island, Island Pond thing mm -hmm. that was done for Westerly. Yep. My father was born and grew up in Island Pond. Uh -huh. When I was a little boy, that bridge was still there. Oh. And in the mid-1930s, my paternal <coughs> grandfather died of a heart attack he had on that bridge. Oh, wow, jeez. <laughs> yes. Um, works project, federal art project, the people in New York decided it was a waste of time and went and chucked it in the dump, the whole thing. There are stories of essentially warehouses full of art that at the end of the day, they're like, what do we do with this stuff? And a lot of it did get destroyed. Yes? I guess one of the challenges of public art you saw in the Burlington mural, Mm -hmm. And I just you said there was one cow, and I did see a canoe, but were those the only Abnakis in the murals? Were yes, the, the Bellows Falls uh, murals, yep. Yep. Wow, she said she saw the mural was in the children's room of the St. John's Bay right. Library. Is that children's part of room of the St. John's Bay? I don't think I've been in there. I will check. Maybe a mural in the St. John's Berry Library. In the uh, children's, children's room. room. All right. How about the children's room of uh, Kellogg Hubbard that had fabulous murals in it? Does it do you know anything about it? No. I think they were painted square. Oh, really? The flood, I think. Oh. When I was a little bit, they were downstairs. They were in the kids. Did they, they, did they get flooded? Uh, yeah. Question in the back? There, I don't know if there's a list online. 
they do have guidance online, General Services Administration, GSA, which now controls this collection. They have guidance online of what to do if you think, you know, you see an auction listing that's clearly a federal arts project piece, let them know. But I don't know if they have a list of things they're looking for, because um, there were so many, you know, tens of, thousands of you know prints and drawings and paintings and ceramics and mm -hmm. well, is there an indicator on the back is there a label that tells you not always <laughs> not always sometimes there'd be a little brass tack on the frame or something but if the piece has been reframed or somebody pops off the plaque it, it's tough to track them down yes uh, so i see in montpelier we got quite a few physical mm -hmm. objects No. I wonder why not. Yeah, I'm not sure uh, exactly how the decisions were made as to what what post office was worthy of a mural. It's. Uh, Right. Yeah. Great. All right. One more. Did you do any work on on theater murals, theater curtains? No, that's a whole other topic. Any of these organizations ever sponsored those? Um, you know, that's a not that I'm aware of. I didn't come across any records for like theater curtains being commissioned through the Federal Arts Project. Um, I think of those as more late 19th, early 20th century. Um, but, you know, you never know. <laughs> there could be some out there. So great, well thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it.